Chapter 14, The Fake Reformer. Great Controversy, Chapter 18, Examined. In Great Controversy, Ellen White spends several chapters delving into the exploits of some of the great Protestant reformers, such as Huss, Luther, Tyndale and Wesley. Then, in Chapter 18, entitled An American Reformer, she introduces us to a fellow named William Miller. The big question is, what reforms did William Miller bring to the people of God that would allow him to be classed with such worthy Protestant leaders? Miller, although a sincere and dedicated Christian, badly misinterpreted Bible prophecy and started a fanatical movement setting dates for the return of Christ. It ended in disaster and ruin, and Miller later admitted it was all a huge mistake. Knowing this, does this man really deserve to be classed with the likes of Huss, Luther, Tyndale and Wesley? Who was William Miller? William Miller was born in 1782. He began attending school at age nine and, like many another farm lad of the day, attended a few terms of the district grammar school when not wanted on the farm. He received no further education after the age of 18. He married in 1803 and began a career of farming. As a young man, he rejected his Baptist upbringing and became a deist. During the years in which he was developing his theories about the date of Christ's return, Miller was deeply involved with occult masonry. He joined the Masonic Lodge in Pulteney, Vermont in 1803 and advanced to the highest degree which the lodges then in the country or in that region could confer. He eventually resigned from Freemasonry in September 1831. Miller served in the War of 1812 as a captain in the United States Army and afterward renewed his Baptist faith. About this time, Miller began studying his King James Version Bible intensely. In 1818, his studies led him to the conclusion that Christ was going to return in 1843. He based this upon his own peculiar calculations and interpretations of various Bible passages. He first presented his findings in a document published in 1822. In September of 1833, Miller was granted a license to preach by the Baptist Church of Hampton and Whitehall, New York. Soon afterward, he began lecturing in various churches, sharing with them his theories on Christ's imminent return. While Miller never personally set an exact date for the return, he narrowed it down to a specific year. Quote, My principles in belief are that Jesus Christ will come again to this earth, cleanse, purify and take possession of the same with all the saints sometime between March the 21st, 1843 and March the 21st, 1844. End of quote. Miller's Proofs In the forerunner to Great Controversy, Ellen White describes how God sent angels to help Miller figure out the Lord was returning in 1843 to 1844. Quote, I saw that God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible and led him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one and guided his mind and opened his understanding to prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given him and he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of truth. End of quote. While Mrs. White attributes Miller's chain of truth to divine guidance, Mr. Miller, after the disappointment of 1844, was not quite so confident the angels of God were behind his findings. Unlike Ellen White, who pretended angels were helping her write her books, Miller wrote, I never pretended to be divinely inspired. So, if Miller did not get the dates by direct inspiration, then how did he come up with them? 
Well, unlike the great Protestant reformers who were familiar with the original languages of the Bible and who studied the rules of proper biblical exegesis at well-respected institutions of higher learning, the grammar school educated Miller took various disparate passages in the King James Version of the Bible and linked them together in the most unconventional ways to come up with proofs that Jesus would return in 1843 to 1844. Despite his lack of training or knowledge of biblical languages, Mrs. White assures us that he possessed strong mental powers, although some might dispute that after reading his 15 proofs of Christ's return. She further assures us he acquired the wisdom of heaven by connecting himself with the source of wisdom. However, we should keep in mind that while he was devising his theories, he was a practising occult mason of the highest degree. As such, one might wonder what source of wisdom he was actually connected to. Miller concocted a total of 15 proofs that showed Jesus would return in 1843. In order to show the absurdity of his proofs, let us examine one of them. Miller claimed that the number 666 would end in 1843. As an example of his so-called strong mental powers and ability to connect to the wisdom of heaven, here is his first proof. Quote, 1. I prove it by the time given by Moses in the 26th chapter of Leviticus, being seven times that the people of God are to be in bondage to the kingdoms of this world or in Babylon, literal and mystical, which seven times cannot be understood less than seven times 360 revolutions of the earth in its orbit, making 2,520 years. I believe this began according to Jeremiah 15:4, and I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem and Isaiah 7, 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. When Manasseh was carried captive to Babylon, and Israel was no more a nation, see chronology, 2 Chronicles 33, 9, so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel, the 677th year BC. Then take 677 out of 2520 leaves AD 1843, when the punishment of the people of God will end. End of quote. Huh? This is an illustration of the reckless proof texting used by Miller to prove his theory. Let us take a closer look at the foundation of this proof, which is Leviticus 26, 18. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. This verse says absolutely nothing about the second coming of Christ. The word times, which appears in the King James Version, is not even in the original Hebrew. The emphasis of this passage is on the degree of punishment, not the length of time. God is saying he will punish sinners more severely by a factor of seven. With proofs like this, it is no surprise that most serious Bible students dismissed Miller's proofs as childish nonsense. The other 14 proofs Miller concocted are equally dubious. Miller managed to garner a small following, primarily among those less educated and those who tended to follow after the latest religious excitement. His disciples called him by the affectionate terms Prophet Miller and Father Miller. After the initial time period passed without event on March the 21st, 1844, Prophet Miller had the courage to admit his mistake to his disappointed followers. After this first disappointment, a new date of October the 22nd, 1844, was proposed by his cohort, Samuel Snow. 
Having already been burned once by his foolhardy date-setting exploits, Prophet Miller was at first reluctant to endorse the new date. However, Snow eventually won Miller over to the new date and Miller signed an endorsement of the date in early October of 1844. On October the 12th, 1844, Prophet Miller published this letter to the editor of The Midnight Cry. Quote, I thank God for this light. My soul is so full I cannot write. My doubts and fears and darkness are all gone. I see that we are yet right and my soul is full of joy. My heart is full of gratitude to God. Oh, how I wish I could shout, but I will shout when the King of Kings comes. Methinks I hear you say, Brother Miller is now a fanatic. Very well, call me what you please. I care not. Christ will come on the seventh month and bless us all. End of quote. Apparently, undaunted at being accurately labelled a fanatic, Prophet Miller staked his religious career on the new date for Christ's return. The Millerite preachers again trumpeted the second coming of Christ and garnered as many as 50,000 followers, many of whom would eventually leave their churches to join the fledgling movement. When Christ again failed to return, there was a second, even bitterer disappointment. The aftermath. The devastation and ruin wreaked by this delusional movement is nearly unparalleled in modern religious history. Financial ruin. Many believers, deluded into thinking they were helping the cause of God, gave liberally to spread the false Millerite message. Not expecting to have need of worldly assets, some sold homes, businesses and lands. Others sold or gave away their jewellery, furniture and farm animals. Some farmers declined to plant crops, thinking it would be a waste of effort, since the Lord was returning before the harvest. After the disappointment, many deluded Millerites and their families were left with little or nothing, reduced to utter poverty, their life savings worse than wasted on a futile effort to convince the world of a false date. Psychological ruin. Aside from the despair of financial ruin, many suffered dearly for their false belief. This ranged from disillusionment to long-term depression and even insanity. Many suffered humiliation, being the subject of derision and mockery from their neighbours for being dull-headed enough to believe Miller's ridiculous proofs. Others suffered deeper problems. Dr. Ronald Numbers examined the records of psychiatric wards after the disappointment and found at least 170 cases admitted to asylums. Fanaticism. Some believers got sucked into the fanatical movements that always prey on the victims of severe emotional letdowns. Some of these fanatical movements, such as James and Ellen White's radicalized shut door Adventists, continued for a while to set new dates for Christ's return. Eventually, those fanatics would either regain their senses and return back to their prior normal life, or else enter newly organised sects, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventism. Health damaged. Perhaps unprepared to spend the entire night outside, according to newspaper reports, there were elderly people and children who collapsed from exposure during the cold, wet night of October the 22nd, 1844. Deaths. Newspapers in the northeastern United States reported a number of suicides and attempted suicides after the disappointment. Some poverty-stricken individuals died of starvation. There were also reports of parents murdering children and husbands murdering wives. Many paid a heavy price for their folly of believing a delusion. Over the next several years, Miller and most of the believers and principal leaders of the movement admitted they were mistaken and returned to their previous churches. Millerite leader George Storrs summed it up well when he wrote in early 1845, quote, 
As the event did not occur, we were mistaken in supposing that we were actuated by the Holy Spirit in making the cry we did in respect to the manner and the time. I repeat, it was not of God. Every day confirms me more and more that it is a true word and the fanaticism that is breaking out almost continually in some form among those who still persist that the entire movement about the tenth day was all of God serves to add to my conviction that we were deluded by a mere human influence which we mistook for the Spirit of God. End of quote. Who was that mere human influence that deluded the people of God? William Miller, the same man who developed his theories of Christ's return while deeply involved with occult masonry. A broken man, Miller withdrew from public ministry but continued to look for the imminent return of Christ until his death in 1849. Now that you know the true history of William Miller, does this sound like the story of a great American reformer? Or does it sound like the story of a deluded fanatic who led God's people astray? William Miller endorsed by Ellen White. Ellen White wrote fondly of Father Miller, believing him to be a modern day John the Baptist. She describes him as such in an early version of Great Controversy. Quote, as John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. End of quote. In later versions of Great Controversy, Mrs. White places Miller alongside the great Protestant reformers such as Luther and Wycliffe. She even goes so far as to compare Miller's calling to preach his false theories on the date of Christ's return with God's call of the prophet Elisha. Quote, As Elisha was called following his oxen in the field to receive the mantle of consecration to the prophetic office, so was William Miller called to leave his plough and open to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God. End of quote. Just exactly what mysteries of God did William Miller open to the people? Mrs. White tells us, quote, In 1818, he reached the solemn conviction that in about 25 years, Christ would appear for the redemption of his people, end of quote. Thus, while a high degree practicing Freemason, Miller felt a calling to preach a mystery that turned out to be a falsehood even by his own admission, and by the admission of every other leader of his own movement. It is a shame and a travesty to compare Freemason Miller's false and delusional message with the true message of John the Baptist and the true message of Elisha. Compare Miller versus Protestant reformers. Knowing what we do of William Miller, knowing that he set false dates for Christ's return, Knowing he developed these teachings while at the highest degree of Freemasonry, knowing that false dates were the primary emphasis of his message, knowing that his message, albeit sincere, deluded thousands of people, does he really deserve to stand among the giants of the Christian faith? Was he really a great reformer? All of the great Protestant reformers were leaders in their churches, had extensive training at top universities, displayed outstanding scholarly achievement and each had far-reaching influence. Ellen White mentions these facts in Great Controversy. Wycliffe, quote, Wycliffe received a liberal education and with him the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. He was noted at college for his fervent piety, as well as for his remarkable talents and sound scholarship. In his thirst for knowledge, he sought to become acquainted with every branch of learning. He was educated in the scholastic philosophy, in the canons of the church and in the civil law, especially that of his own country. The power of his genius and the extent and thoroughness of his knowledge commanded the respect of both friends and foes. 
His adherents saw with satisfaction that their champions stood foremost among the leading minds of the nation. Huss and Jerome. Huss studied at the provincial school and then repaired to the university at Prague, receiving admission as a charity scholar. At the university, Huss soon distinguished himself by his untiring application and rapid progress, while his blameless life and gentle winning deportment gained him universal esteem. After completing his college course, he entered the priesthood and rapidly attained to eminence. He soon became attached to the court of the king. He was also made professor and afterward rector of the university where he had received his education. In a few years, the humble charity scholar had become the pride of his country and his name was renowned throughout Europe. Brilliancy of genius, eloquence and learning, gifts that win popular favour, were possessed in preeminent degree by Jerome. Luther. At the age of 18, he entered the University of Erfurt. A retentive memory, a lively imagination, strong reasoning powers and untiring application soon placed him in the foremost rank among his associates. Luther was ordained a priest and was called from the cloister to a professorship in the University of Wittenberg. Here he applied himself to the study of the scriptures in the original tongues. After his return from Rome, Luther received at the University of Wittenberg the degree of Doctor of Divinity. Lefebvre. Lefebvre, a man of extensive learning, a professor in the University of Paris. Leaders of the English Reformation. Barnes and Frith, the faithful friends of Tyndale, arose to defend the truth. The Ridleys and Cranmer followed. These leaders in the English Reformation were men of learning. End of quote. The reformers often appeared before kings and high government officials. Quote, Other teachers who ranked high for their ability and learning joined in proclaiming the gospel and it won adherents among all classes from the homes of the artisans and peasants to the palace of the king. End of quote. While the reformers appeared before kings, Millerism was derided by US President John Quincy Adams, who found himself greatly marvelling that men should have been so absurd to have put their faith in it. Now compare and contrast what you have just read about the great Protestant reformers to William Miller. The Protestant reformers held positions of high responsibility in their respective churches. William Miller. His principal occupation was a farmer. Although ordained, he never held a leadership role in the Baptist Church. The Protestant reformers were highly educated. They received extensive training in Christian history and in the principles of biblical interpretation. William Miller did not enjoy the advantages of a collegiate education. He had no formal training in the principles of biblical interpretation. The Protestant reformers were fluent in the original biblical languages. William Miller had no understanding of the original biblical languages. The Protestant reformers were noted for their scholarly work at their universities. William Miller produced no scholarly work, but he did reach the highest degree of occult Freemasonry. The Protestant reformers were called to speak before kings and rulers. William Miller's movement was ridiculed as absurd by the president of the USA. The Protestant reformers' teachings centred on the gospel of Jesus Christ. William Miller's teachings were virtually devoid of the gospel. The Protestant reformers refused to recant their teachings and some were martyred. William Miller recanted and admitted his teachings were erroneous. The doctrine of the Protestant reformers led millions of people to a better, happier life. William Miller's delusions led thousands of people into failure, bitter disappointment and ruin. Conclusion. In studying the results of the life work of William Miller, it is difficult to understand how one could possibly place him in the same league as the great Protestant reformers like Luther, Huss and Jerome. 
Furthermore, it is a blazon mischaracterization to suggest his work was on par with true biblical prophets, such as Elisha and John the Baptist. While Miller may have been sincere in his efforts, his proofs of Christ's imminent return were not only fanatical and incorrect, but downright ridiculous. Christian leaders attempted to reason with him, but to no avail. He stubbornly refused to listen to more educated and sensible brethren. The movement he inspired is now regarded as little more than a regrettable blemish on Christian history. William Miller was not the great American reformer Mrs. White makes him out to be. He was a misguided and deluded individual who led many down a false path. Thankfully, he later publicly admitted his mistake and owned up to the fact that the whole movement was a grand delusion. However, the damage was done, and some believers made shipwreck of their faith never to recover. <laughs>